I am the Reading Rainbow Emperor, and today I'm going to talk about Joseph Joestar, the trickster, or the successor. A lot of is a lot of people they sort of come through uh, JoJo's Bizarre Adventure Part One, and they go, "Oh, you know, that was pretty good. I don't know if if I really if I really you know." If it's really for me, if I could stand another round of vampires. And then, Araki really goes crazy. Even from the first chapter, he starts throwing curveballs in a battle tendency, which is weirdly the least memorable name of the eight. Uh, he starts throwing curveballs with uh, Strizo. Uh, going evil, and Speedwagon potentially dying, with the crazy fight between Streitzo and Joseph Joestar, as well as all the other things, and throughout it all, the linchpin isn't, say, just Joseph, but rather Joseph and Caesar, and then Joseph and Lisa Lisa, Joseph and Cars, is not just one man in his search for vengeance, but rather... It is the full experience. You see, William Zappelli and uh, Speedwagon, all that, all those guys, they worked with Jonathan Joestar, but always the onus was on Jonathan Joestar. The schwerpunkt of the story never changed from him and Dio. Their conflict, even when he's fighting uh, Brutus or... Um, I haven't wa read that in a very long time. Not not very long time. Um, even when he's fighting Brutus, even when he's fighting the many vampires, Dio is never far behind. In Joseph's case, other characters take momentum from him quite often. In fact, the, they almost delight in specifically stealing momentum just because they can. Guys like... ACDC, Caesar, Lisa Lisa even, sort of move the momentum of the story towards other ends, but it always returns to Joseph Joestar. Joseph Joestar and his feud with Wamu and Cars. Joseph Joestar and his friendship with Caesar. Joseph Joestar and his vengeance seeking with Lisa Lisa over the death of Caesar. It never ends. You see, Joseph Joestar is Jonathan's successor. Not quite in the sense of, like, son of, but rather, because Jorge Joestar is the son of Jonathan, uh, but rather in the sense that he is the next level. You see, it goes. JoJo's Bizarre Adventure goes in a cycle from the absolute perfect heroic character to somebody... Very morally gray, jo uh, Josuke Part 8, Jojolian, of uh, Jojolian, who is, he's good, he doesn't do anything really evil, but he is a mix of Kira, of a good Kira Yoshikage and uh, Josuke Higashikata. Um... It's a little bit different. He's not an an Joseph isn't an anti-hero. He's not morally gray at all. In fact, he's almost as good as his grandfather. The only difference is that he's a little bit more angry, which honestly isn't really a, a moral a moral issue. Um, like it's sometimes portrayed. Many times people like to suppress their emotions or say that men especially should suppress their emotions or that men should give in to their emotions, but once it's anger, mmm, not that one. You keep that one in the closet. You, you, you put that one back. Uh, and so, seeing a character like that, who does have that hidden anger within him that drives him on uh, to perform violent acts and to demand he control his environment, is absolutely astounding. He loses this trait uh, towards his old age, but that's more of a mellowing out anyway. He still has anger, and he still has outbursts of emotions more than anyone except for maybe Paul Jean uh, Pierre Paul Nareff who is himself a very emotional man. Uh, Joseph Joestar, as the successor, is perfect uh, in that role. His friendship with Zappelli, uh, Caesar Zappelli, goes on to the next level. His 
uh, drive to defeat his enemies is greater than Jonathan's drive to defeat Dio. Not in the sense of John- Jonathan was unyielding in his righteousness, but he kind of just powered through. Joseph subverts his enemies, subverts his enemies' expectations, and then destroys them, oftentimes with less, less damage potentially done to him. Uh, Jonathan Joestar nearly lost his arms. Like, it, it, there's a lot, there was a lot of potential if he hadn't, you know, stuck his sword into the fire, if he hadn't, you know, been saved by William Zeppeli, if, you know, Speedwagon wasn't there. Like, as, as weird as it say, like, Speedwagon took care of their horse and carriage, Speedwagon, uh, smashed the, the stone mass, Speedwagon was always kind of, kind of just there and in the good way too like he was always encouraging them reacting to them noticing things um you know helping out and it's like it's one of those things like having a character who's just good for morale is a great addition to companies to parties to everything he's like a bard except less uh sex every with everything Mm. um If we look through, you know, battle tendency and see how Joseph relates to his villains, he first deals with strike, well, ignoring bit players who never show up again or have no effect on the plot, past or present, future, Uh, his battle with Stryzo. Instead of having some sort of, uh, shall we say, straight up one up of his father, like defeating a weakened D or whatever. He instead defeats somebody who knows how to handle Hamon, who has the techniques, who may not be as evil or creative as Dio, but still has thought about and set up counters to, uh, his one true weakness. It's also a great ability to show that Joseph, even though he likes to play a big gray moral game, is that he is very much black and white. Even though he might use a trick in battle, all fa- all is fair in love and war. Uh, not so much love, but certainly war. These are not humans. This, if, if he was a chivalrous knight, it would be a different situation. He is fighting vampires. He is fighting uber vampires who treat humans as less than cattle. It's not the same thing at all. It's not the same, same demands of a character as, say, knight versus knight. The fight between Bruford... No, yeah, Bruford was the big one. Uh, what was the other guy's name? Joseph. Huh? Do 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 do. Bill Bruford. Nope, nope, not quite that. Huh? There we go. Phantom Blood characters. This is, this is just bothering me. Tarkus was the evil one. Bruford was the good one. There we go. His fight with Bruford was honorable. He took care of things, he didn't take any advantage that was underhanded, uh, but that was the fight between them. Tarkus, on the other hand, was underhanded, was, um, you know, very villainous, was brutal, he didn't mind as much collateral damage as possible. So, you know, that's what Jonathan had to fight. Joseph he'll trick people. He uses magician tricks all the time. He sets up traps ahead of time. He tries to, you know, pretend he's running away so someone goes after him. Blah, blah, blah. You know, that sort of thing is not the same as dishonorable fighting. Um, That, you know, some people... I've heard claim, not like claim as in like, Oh, Joseph, Joseph was evil or anything like that, but that he was a tricky fighter or that he was morally gray. Not so. He never breaks that moral code of his grandfather. And in fact, that's very important. His grandfather left a bright and shining star throughout the rest of the cast. I talked about that in the previous video, Jonathan Joestar, the foundation. Instead, he sort of takes that star and is cunning with it. It's a subtle blow rather than a straightforward punch. And that's true to his character. It would be boring to see another Jonathan Joestar. And in fact, if we had seen Jorge Joestar's um, 
Jonathan Joestar's son in action, it would have been less than impressive because it's a tragedy and it's a short tragedy. There aren't, you know, this uber vampire who has all this stuff with you. It's just, hey, your dad didn't kill him. He didn't know he existed. He hid himself from your grandfather, from your father. And, you know, now you got to deal with it. And he fails. And it's, it's sad. You know, Lisa Lisa has to kill him instead. You know, instead we move straight to uh, somebody who develops the formula more, who brings it out better than it was before. You see, there's two types of successors. There's the worthy successor and the ill non-worthy of uh, the unworthy successor the worthy successor handles things grows things brings things into fruition the unworthy successor squanders it it makes it less than uh, shall we say less than valuable it's like there's a saying that wealth doesn't last three generations and it's a very true saying wealth can be wasted unless it's you know billions of dollars in the sense a uh, whole thing of of three generations a grandson will not have the same understanding what of what makes a business as a son or his grandfather instead um you know Joseph Joestar actually avoids this he it doesn't squander his goodness at all, uh, even until his old age. Uh, he's still a morally good character. Now, it doesn't mean he doesn't make stupid decisions. He does. He does. He is a lusty man and an adventurous one. That means that when it comes to like non-story morality, he makes bad choices. He married Susie Q just out of the blue. He made, you know, bad decisions. I, I can't stress that enough. He sinned. You know, he was a man. Uh, you know, he fell in love with some Japanese girl and, you know, didn't marry her and fostered a bastard who fortunately came out well rather than uh, evil. <laughs> it's almost as if he had, uh, Josuke had his grandfather's spirit watching over him taking care of him of sorts, making sure that he has that heroic je ne sais quoi. Despite his uh, uh, his true father's abandonment, what's more, Josuke had the benefit of his policeman's, uh, gra policeman grandfather. But we'll talk about that in a bit, in, in his own video. Uh, it affects him. It doesn't change the fact that Josuke, uh, jo uh, Joseph is heroic. It doesn't change the fact that he did not squander Jonathan's wealth, but grew it. And he made it so firm that even Jotaro's violence and foul mouth does little to affect our view of the Joestar's heroic bloodline. And when you come to a more morally pure character, rather, like, I don't want to say pure, her, like, pure white, but rather in the sense of pure heroic. Like, if we view it as a sliding scale of heroic to anti-heroic, uh, but not black and white, it works out better. Because, um, Joseph's kind of in the middle of heroic and anti-heroic. He's got that trickster archetype going for him, but at the same time, he never makes a morally gray choice. He worked with the Nazis. He didn't work with the Nazis. The Nazis coerced him into working with them. Like, it's he didn't like go, oh, we gotta talk to the Nazis. No. No. That's not at all what happened. Stroheim stole the jewel first and then held it over them. Um... Battle tendency itself is, is a development from Phantom Blood. It has all the wacky hijinks and many boss squads and then compelling villains that Part 1 had, because Dio is a very compelling villain even then. Uh, and it, it just sort of grows the formula yet again. It is probably one of the best written parts of JoJo. People complain that Caesar Zapelli's friendship with Joseph is, is too short, but have you seen two alpha males? interact with each other have you seen you know two men two real men not nerds not people who take slights at a single little thing but rather people who might hate each other but are perfectly willing to work with each other because their personal hatred isn't you know more important than 
training, saving the world, anything else like that. And besides that, they spent three days together in the pillar. It's, it's you know, who knows how long they spent before then. You know, it, it you, you don't go through trials like that and not bond with people. Like, that's why people who go through war together are friends. Or they hate each other and they never talk to each other again, but they'll still, you know, interact with each other, work with each other, uh, you know, during the conflict. It's it's a good enough friendship. Uh, but, hmm, you know, people say the things that they do. Caesar Zappelli is a fulmination of William Zappelli. Um just as much as Joseph is. Uh, he he has all the goodness of his grandfather. But instead of Joseph's, ca- Joseph's case, where he was always good, if a bit violent, speed, uh, Speedwagon Caesar... Sorry, I don't know why I said Speedwagon. I hope I haven't been saying Speedwagon throughout this entire time. Caesar caused the death of his father. He hated his father. His father was gone, and... He became a vagabond, as many people without fathers become. They become lost. They become violent. In a, in a, like our society is very clean, very gentle, if you will. Instead, Caesar became violent because it was, you know, 1930 uh, Italy. There was a lot of upheaval during those times. People, you know, people like to to point out, you know, there was upheaval, but you know, we have we like you. A pride parade has nothing on Weimar, Germany. That place was messed up, and people were more moral back then. People understood right from wrong back then. So it caused a much more different and violent reaction. Italy was tearing itself apart. It was barely a country to begin with, and it had only been formed 50 to 60 years ago anyway. You know, so on and, and so forth. You know, like... The world was in upheaval then, and order was starting to come come back, as such as it was. So, him growing up during that time, of course he would become the way he was. Of course he would, he would lack that, that culture that men like William Zappelli and others had. Instead, you know, he had to refine it. His father died for him, even though he didn't recognize him. And that goodness was passed on to him, and he became the true inheritor of his father and grandfather, just as Joseph already was that. He, there was no gap in time in Joseph's life that there was in Caesar, leading him to be an excellent foil, also angry, also driven, also given to passions that, you know, men today aren't exactly as they once were. I've seen how people interact with each other. Uh, and eventually you reach a place where you get high status male who doesn't think of himself in the same way that I do or others do. Uh, and it's like watching s- something from that, you know, it's like, ugh, ugh, you know, get a room, but he doesn't care, you know, and it's like, you can say a snide remark, but it's, it's not going to mean anything. You know, no point in challenging it. Such as it is with how Caesar and uh, Joseph meet, except Joseph is the type of person to comment on it and make a, and try to, you know, bring out that trickster archetype. It's great. So we have, throughout Part 2, Battle Tendency, the idea that these wills, these goodness, this heroism is inherited, not explicitly, you know, played out, but instead, you know, the central sort of hidden thing, hidden theme. Cars, Wamu, ACDC, and kind of Santana, have no inheritance and have no descendants. <coughs> Even though they are immortal godlike beings, they don't have anyone to come after them. Those four are the last of the pillar men, and they're all there ever be. 
perhaps if they had found some women children of their type, you know, when they slaughtered the amount, perhaps when they had grown into full age for whatever a pillarman's full age is, perhaps they could have had more generations, but instead it's just four men. And they don't seem to, like, asexually reproduce or anything like that. It's, it's you know, and besides that, they, they aim to be gods. Uh, at least Wamu, Santana, uh, not Santana, sorry, uh, ACDC and Cars uh, aim to be gods. And it's it's so different. It's so different than that. They lack successors. There is no will but their own that they fight for. Perhaps Wamu could be called, uh, and Santana could be called the son of Cars, but in reality, he's a subordinate. Like Just like Santana is considered little more than a guard dog to them. And it's so cruel. They must have been the closest thing to father figures that they had, yet they treat him with barely any respect, barely a thought, barely more than one line. How different they are. So you have that contrast that makes Joseph and Jonathan Starr shine all the brighter. Because unlike Dio, which rejected his inheritance and heritage and has no successor but his own until he meets Pucci, because uh, Giorno, while being his son, is not really his, his son's son. He's a mix between Jonathan and Dio, and his and Dio's uh, Jonathan's heroism affects him, even as Dio's morally great character affects him. Yay! Uh, it's not weird at all! <laughs> it's so weird! It's so good, though. Um, so we move on. Like, once, once, you know, Cars is defeated, once Joseph nearly makes the ultimate sacrifice, he gets married to Suzy Q, he gets his, you know, robotic right hand, we move on to Dio's revival, where Joseph leads a leads the team with Jotaro Kujo to take on Dio. It is appropriate that Jotaro is the one to kill Dio and not Joseph for several reasons. The first one being is that Joseph is not the same sort of physical character that Jonathan and Jotaro are. He is a trickster hero, not a fighting hero. He is, you know, not built for it. Sure, he has the body build, but that's not the same thing at all. Um... you know, it's like, it's, there's subtleties to it. There's subtleties. Uh, you know, like, he, he tried several tricks against Dio, but Dio can stop time to take time to think about it. And he knows all the tricks that Jonathan pulled on him, and so can think about what tricks could be pulled on him by Joseph. Even though Jonathan's tricks were so simple, you know, Dio was so arrogant that they worked. Then there's, you know... Uh, then there's the fact that it's it's even though it's jo, uh, Joseph's daughter that is afflicted by the stand disease, it is Jotaro Kujo himself that is the one to defeat. Uh, uh, sorry, it is Jotaro Kujo's mother that is on the line? Joseph's daughter, Jotaro Kujo's mother. And that's very important. There's a stronger bond on motherhood than there is on father to daughter. A daughter leaves the family to join in with somebody else. The the mother sticks with the family. The wife of uh, the son joins. The mother stays. Therefore, there's a much greater hold on it. Besides that, Joseph is explicitly across the world, living away from his daughter. Therefore, he doesn't see her every day. Jotaro does, even though he complains about it. So on and so forth. The bond there is just stronger. And besides the fact that Jotaro is the main character of Part 3, Joseph is the advisor, is the trip planner, not the main fighter. It is thematically inappropriate for him to fight Dio. So we have all those things. Um, the similarities between Jonathan and Jotaro. The uh, bond between a son and his mother versus a father and his daughter, which is still very legitimate. And if Jotaro didn't exist, there'd be more of an argument for it. But even then, like the story wouldn't work without Jotaro. Uh, and then... 
just the thematic appropriateness of how the characters are played. Uh, his appearance in part four of a wizened old man who is who seems to be losing his grip, but still has those sparks of cleverness. For example, when he let out his blood into the water, knowing that Josuke could heal him if he reached him in time. Uh, is very clever and uh you know joe's uh josuke stealing his wallet's very funny and there's you know like all this different thing and it's like it is more passing the torch from joseph to josuke even though it was a morally great black even thing that he did you know knocking up some girl in japan and and never marrying her it's it's still you know, once he knows about it, he comes back and, you know, includes Josuke in the will and bears his wife's displeasure. Um, I can't imagine what that would be like for the family. So horrible. But also, he was honest. You know, when it was caught, he's like, yeah, you're right. You're absolutely right. Uh, and uh, I should meet him and he needs to be included in the will. You know, that's, you know, it's like he hit it. But when it was found out, he owned up to it. At least that's my interpretation of it. You could also say that, you know, he didn't want a, uh, a lawsuit, which is perfectly legitimate. Uh, he didn't want this or that. You know, he he, he only owned uh, accepted it because he was found out. But I, I was under, understanding that he didn't know about Josuke. It's, it's one of those things. I doubt that if... If, uh, you know, I doubt she was the only, only dalliance in his, uh, in his, uh, let me see, what was her name? Huh, Tomoko, there we go. I doubt Tomoko was the only, uh, dalliance in Joseph Joestar's, uh, life. <laughs> uh, it's, um... You know, Joseph overall, looking over his life, uh, I assume he he's the only one, he's the only Joestar that is said to have died uh, of natural causes. Uh, and that's true. He was a clever enough man to die of natural causes, as strange as that is. To say, he didn't, he thought his way out of potential, let's you and me both die together situations. Like with... Um, oh, what was her name? Empress, I think? Yeah, that feels right. Empress feels right. Or with, um, or with cars at the end. You know, he, he withstood Wamu, who was probably one of the greatest of uh, villainous warriors in the series. Um, let's be real, Kira Yoshikage isn't the same sort of villain as Cars or Wamu, specifically Wamu, uh, you know, in, in pure fighting stance, maybe, uh, you know, Dio, D-I-O, uh, not D, uh, D -A -D -O Brando, um, from the first one, uh, maybe he could be a match just because of his time powers, you know, maybe, maybe Diavolo kind of, but only because he's bullshit. <laughs> um, and there's an interesting play of duality with uh, Golden Wind that I'll talk about in its appropriate episode. You know, like, so Dio Brando uh, is not the same fighter as Wamu. Uh, Wamu could school, um, assuming, of course, he could fight stands. Like, let's, let's just say that there's no problem with stands. He doesn't get a stand, but he can punch people and can interact with stands such as they can't just, like, one-shot KO him. Not like, isn't, like, Kring Crimson could, you know, like, uh, a good, you know, or, a, you know, like, Star Platinum could do it. Like, Wamu could fight Jotaro, and it would probably be a pretty even fight. Um... But just villain-wise, like main villain-wise, because uh, Wamu is the main physical villain of the of the uh, he's the heavy of uh, not the heavy the brute sort of of um, battle tendency. You know, Dio Brando doesn't compare. Uh, none of the villains in Part Four compare uh, in fighting uh, stance. Um, you know, K K Kira, you know, isn't a fighter isn't a fighter. He can fight, but he isn't a fighter. He doesn't have that fighting spirit. Uh, in part five, let's see here. Um, hmm. 
you know, King Crimson probably has a chance. Uh, maybe, maybe Risotto. Maybe Giacho. I don't really think Giacho has a chance, though, just because uh, there's a whole bunch of abilities uh, that hap that uh, Wamu has available uh, to himself, including Wind. He could probably s strangle Giacho. Um, Prosciutto would have no effect on him. Uh, Aluzo, you know, like he's he's a solo dude. Formaggio wouldn't work. Uh, no one knows what Sorbet and Gelato can do. Rosado only because his ability is blood-based. That's it. Uh, but I'm pretty sure that in, like, a more equal fight, it wouldn't work. Uh, Notorious Big might do it, but that's 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 a one-shot. Like, that's not the same sort of thing. Um, Chocolata and Seco just don't, don't really have a chance. Seco's good, but he's not good enough. Um, let's see here. In Stone Ocean, uh, I'm getting distracted. <laughs> Sorry about that. There isn't really any villains, uh, that have the physical stats necessary to fight Whamu. Um, in Steel Ball Run, uh, maybe Dinosaur Diego could have a good fight with him. Maybe, uh... Uh, Ringo Road, not Ringo Road again, sorry, Blackmore. Um, in Jojolian, uh, the only villain that could stand up to him in a fight is, uh, let's see, where is it? Where is it? Damo, Tamaki Damo, who turns everything soft. Uh, but otherwise, no, no, nothing. Um, you know, like, I'm just sort of looking through this. I'm searching for, like, people who could match him as a physical fight-off. And it just doesn't really work. It doesn't really exist. Uh, you know, there is no villain in any JoJo that matches Wamu's physical capabilities. Even Cars uh, is in p terms of skill. Uh, not trickery. Not, not things like um, cleverness. And if you're just talking raw fighting talent is inferior to Whamu. And Joseph Josar survived that, where, you know, Jonathan was killed by Dio, uh, Brando. Um, you know, Kira kills the entire crew uh, once, Rohan twice, uh, Diavolo kills Bucciolati. You know, like these characters get wiped out. Um, by their, um, excuse me, these characters get wiped out by less than what the greatest Joseph fought. Joseph survived. You know, he earned his natural causes death, where others, not so much. You know, they didn't have that spirit. Even Jonathan Joestar couldn't stand up to Poochie uh, when Poochie, you know, made him choose between his daughter and him. Like, it, it just, when it came down to it, Jonathan couldn't. It's one of those things where if you look over the whole of Joseph's life and the villains he fought and the things that he overcame and the things that he's done, he stands as a shining example of what a Joe star could be fully realized with all the intelligence, all the strength, all the brotherhood and friendship, all the, all the moxie, all the luck, all the pluck in one character that reinforces what it means to be a Joe star. And that's being the hero. That's it. If you, if you are a Joe star, starting with Jonathan, you must be a hero. Not because some moral code or anything like that, but because fate itself and that human element mixed together make it happen. So that even if you're the trickiest man alive facing uber vampires, you know, 6,000 plus years old, you'll still come out on top.
And that's so very important in understanding Joseph's character, his history, and his place in the Joestar bloodline. Thank you for joining with me on this lovely voyage, and I hope you all have a wonderful evening. You're all wonderful. Please check out the links down below. Goodbye.